This morning, I'd like to take a, a few minutes and talk to you about uh, what I believe to be a very important subject, one that gives all the glory to God and to His Son, Jesus Christ, whose death we will be uh, commemorating uh, in a way that He has taught us to do, the way He taught His disciples to do 2,000 years ago. The, the title of my sermon and the subject that I want you to consider is Immediate Regeneration. Immediate Regeneration. I'll, I'll define those terms for you in a moment. I am mindful that the scriptures warn us uh, in multiple places to not be too um, to not be too contentious when it comes to the mysteries of God. And by that, this is what I mean. Um, in Second Timothy chapter, you don't need to turn here. Just let me read you a few verses. In Second Timothy chapter uh, two. In verse 23, actually verse 22, he says, uh, as Paul is talking to Timothy, he says, Flee off also youthful lusts, and that of course applies to all of us, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But then he says this, he says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. So here's a, here's a point that we can sit down and we can start to think about the things of God and how he acts. And if we take it too far and, and delving into things that are simply uh, beyond what God has taught us in his word, we really are in, in danger of going so far that we may, instead of causing unity to come upon the church, there's actually division. Foolish and unlearned questions. I certainly do not want to engage in that. Another signpost that we can follow along is the Apostle Paul's statements to uh, uh, the church at, Cor uh, at Corinth. Remember, Brother Mark preached to us several wonderful sermons uh, on, on first, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. I just want to point out that in 1 Corinthians, when he's talking about the, the primacy of love, he says, I could have all these other things. I could have knowledge, and I could understand all doctrines, and I could even be able to speak with the tongues of angels and men. But he says, but if I don't have love, if I don't have charity, then I'm just as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. That, that's the preeminence. So I want to frame our discussion this morning on that. And I'd like to ask you to turn with me, if you would, to the third chapter of the book of John, John chapter 3. Now, I said I want to talk about immediate regeneration. There's a lot of terms in the Bible that uh, identify important doctrinal uh, uh, areas of understanding uh, in our limited way. And all of these terms are important, and we need to rightly divide them, and we need to understand them. One such word is regeneration. I might throw out the word conversion. I might throw out the word redemption. I might throw out the word atonement. I might throw out the word sanctification. I might throw out the word justification and, and many others. I, I could even throw out the word salvation. Okay, All of these are not exactly the same. You'll understand that the Bible uses different terms for these because they do uh, promote different concepts. How they interrelate and how they're used, you must interpret them in the context of the Scripture. So regeneration is a term that is often used. It's used in the Bible twice. But it comes to mean, and the way I intend to use it, I believe the way that the Apostle Paul used it, or used it in the Greek, is to renew, okay? It, to renew something. In Matthew uh, 19 and 28, you don't need to turn there, but he's talking about, Jesus is talking about the resurrection. And when he talks about in the regeneration, you shall come and sit down uh, with the 12 tribes, uh, sit down with the patriarchs and, and, and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus there uses the term to mean the resurrection. And that is a good term. It's a good way to describe regeneration because it really will be renewed. When Jesus comes back, not only are all of God's saints, whatever church they go to, or even if they don't go to church, if he's redeemed them, they're going to come out of the grave and we're going to be with the Lord forever. He's going to judge the wicked. He's going to judge the righteous. He's going to renew creation and we're going to live forever with him in the new heavens and the new earth as the Bible clearly teaches us. But I do want you to see that at least one place in the KJV, the word regeneration does not mean being born again in the sense that we think about. In, in the book of Tim, uh, excuse me, the book of Titus, though, in chapter three, he talks about how that God saved us 
not according to our works, but he has washed us with the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. There he is talking about being born again. And that's what most Christians say whenever you're talking about, are you a born again child of God? Have you been regenerated? In other words, has the Holy Spirit come down and given you life? And I'm, I rejoice to say that in all the countless uh, billions of, of Christians that are alive today and who have lived since the time of Jesus Christ, that everybody has believed that it is God who saves us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. And so there is some merit to delving into this a little bit to say, how is it that God saves us? How God gives life? but not so far that we are being divisive and uh, raising situations. Because our, our, fa- our Baptist forefathers, while they believed the doctrine that we believe, that is immediate regeneration, um, that it was not maybe as clear to them as it is to us who have thought about it. Because I'll tell you right now, um, most people in the, in the world right now, I would say probably 90% of the Christians in the world today do not believe in immediate regeneration. They believe in instrumental regeneration. In other words, there's an instrument involved. So I want to turn to uh, Roman uh, John chapter 3, bring to mind some verses here, talk about that, and then I'd like to go to some places in the Old Testament and show that. When we say that God immediately regenerates, immediate, we sometimes think of that, that has to do with timing, and yes, it does, like I'll be there immediately. If if you ask me to walk to the back, I say, yes, I'll be there immediately. But the term actually is a little bit broader. What it really means is it's non-mediated. There's no mediator. There's no, if I say I'm going to be there immediately, that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop by on my way to drive to where you are and, and you know get a soda. I'll be there immediately means there's nothing in between my, my, uh, where I'm starting out and where I'm going to be. Well, we understand in the scriptures, and I'll I'll show you here, that it is Jesus Christ who speaks life to his children. And uh, you can't say it's mediated by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that brings life, but there's nothing in between. There's no means or instrumentation. You don't have to be in the presence of the preaching of the gospel by man in order to be born again. You don't have to be baptized or say the sinner's prayer. Or if you're a Catholic, and I'm, I have a lot of good friends, so I'm not pleased, I'm not being divisive in any way, but they believe the church is the means and the sacrament is the means that gets you into heaven. And in fact, when you die, you probably have to go to a place called purgatory because there's some more mediation that has to happen. Uh, I've got friends who are Mormons. And again, I'm not running any of these people down. I'm just trying to express to you what the primitives believe and what I'm going to talk about. But they pray for the dead, you know, and and they do this in good faith, but they're trying to mediate. That is called medial (laughs) regeneration. The Bible, however, I believe, teaches plainly and clearly that we are regenerated immediately. That is without mediation. God gives you life. And that is glorifying to God. So in John chapter 3, we find that there's this man named Nicodemus. We read about him in other places in the scripture that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a ruler among the Jews. I believe he is expressing faith here. I believe that this man himself has already been born of the Spirit of God. But he comes to Jesus by night. And his desire is to have a private audience with the Lord to discuss the things that Jesus has been doing in Jerusalem. Because all of Jerusalem is in an uproar. And it says that, Master, we know, Rabbi, teacher, we know that thou art a a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, that's a true statement. It's a correct statement. The the healing powers, the ability that, that Jesus manifested, even early in his ministry, were clearly intended to be a sign that he was the fulfillment of all of the prophecies that had been spoken of him in the past. Uh, many of the, uh, the miracles that the nation of Israel relied upon were those that were done in the days of Moses. Remember the, the, the rescue, the redemption of the nation of Israel out of, out of uh, Egypt. And you know that uh, water was turned to wine and darkness. And the, you know the, the, their forefathers saw the, the, uh, the Red Sea part uh, and they walked on dry land or so. But notice what Jesus said. He says that um, the Lord your God is going to raise up a prophet like unto me or like me. Him ye shall hear. You need to listen to him talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, um, the the 
Nicodemus is correctly saying, you are doing the kinds of things that Moses did. We know that you're approved of God. We know that you're sent by God. We're here to listen to you. And Jesus says a very remarkable thing. He says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay? That's, this, these are words of the master. Except a man be born again, and this is regeneration, this is what I'm talking about, until and, 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 and at such point that God does give the new birth, someone simply cannot see the kingdom. So presenting the kingdom to someone who ha does not have new birth is, is uh, going to be ineffectual because it is the work of God. He says plainly, you cannot see it, you cannot perceive it. Now, it's not to say that we don't preach the gospel to all men, because we do, but that is uh, only going to have effect if someone's already born again. Now, Nicodemus did not understand this. He, he questioned this. He thought that Jesus was talking about physical birth. He says that, how can this be? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He says, what are you, what are you saying? And Jesus goes, goes on to uh, make the distinction between flesh and spirit, natural birth and spiritual birth. And this is where uh, we, when we talk about being born again, when we talk about being regenerated, we use this because this is the terminology that Jesus used. You must be born. But he says that which is of flesh is born of the flesh. That which is born of the spirit is, is of the spirit. And he says, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. It's absolutely necessary. But then he explains how how people are born again. And as I said, this is what uh, many people do not understand. It says, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. He says, you really can't see the wind. He uses this as a natural example, but he's He's describing the Holy Spirit of God as it moves through the hearts of God's people. He says, it's like the wind. He says, you can hear the sound thereof, and you can tell which way it's blowing, but you can't direct it, and you can only see the effects. That's, that's the meaning of this, of this verse. We go outside and say, hey, look at that wind. Well, you're not really looking at the wind because the wind is invisible, but you can see the trees sway. And you know the trees are swaying because the Spirit has moved by them and caused them to to, 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 to swing in the, in the wind. And that's what Jesus says. Notice Jesus says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. If you require the Scriptures to have a instrumentality, if you require it, for example, that it's, it's, it's incumbent that you hear the gospel as preached by man, I will stress that. I believe that God preaches the gospel solely, they shall all be taught of God. Okay, I, if, you're, if you're talking about, well, is everyone who is born again going to hear the gospel? Yeah, if you'll let me preface that with, they'll hear it directly from the mouth of Jesus. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that at all. God says, I'll write my law in your hearts and in your minds, and you shall be a God, and I shall be your God, and you shall be my people. That's from Jeremiah. But I want you to think about that, what Jesus is, is plainly saying to this befuddled man. He says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You know, you, uh, there's, uh, it's very common uh, to say, well, there's an ordinary way in which God gives life, but then there's also extraordinary ways. Okay? For example, if you believe that it requires the preaching of the gospel by man in order, to, in order for God to, to regenerate you, then you have to have another way for babies to be born, uh, to be born again. You have to have another way for people who have never heard the gospel. And everybody that I know that I talk about with this does do say, well, yes, the ordinary way in which God does this is uh, by, hear, by the hearing and the believing of the gospel is preached by man. But people who have never heard the gospel, people who lived in foreign lands and never had a, a missionary come, or people who died in childbirth, or people who... Uh, uh, you know, have, are mentally incompetent, unable or un, un, unable to hear it. There has to be a different way. So you see, even even people who profess that there's instrumentality involved, their hearts tell them that really, at least in some cases, God is sovereign and He will act by Himself. Well, I'm here to tell you that Jesus doesn't say, well, some some ways the Spirit does it this way, and some ways the Spirit does it this other way. But in every case. 
whether you lived in the Old Testament or you live in the New, whether you have heard the sound of the gospel or not, he says everyone is born by the Spirit, by the action of God. In the fifth chapter of the book of John, Jesus is standing in the temple and he's talking to certain uh, religious leaders here uh, from the same class as Matthew, excuse me, as uh, Nicodemus was. And they're looking for authority on his behalf for have done the things that he did. He healed a man on the Sabbath day. And so the latter part of this chapter is a discussion concerning the authority, those things that, that uh, profess and show Christ's uh, authority to be able to, to come and, uh, and, and, and testify and be the one that he is, as he declared to be the Son of Man. He says, you know, John the Baptist uh, spoke of me. He, he bears witness of me. My father speaks, bears witness of me. Moses bears witness of me. So in my own works, bear witness and that you ought to believe. But he says this interesting thing where he says in verse um, 25, John 5, 25, he says, Verily, verily, again, this is the words of the Lord Jesus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. The time is coming, and now is. And that's hard for me to think about. How is it that Jesus Christ could be here in, 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 as a human, all God, all man, and he's having this conversation, but at some, in some mysterious way, in some beautiful way, he's also engaged in the uh, ex exact same time he was engaged in speaking life to people perhaps all over the planet. And that's, that's strange, but nevertheless, that's what he says. Time is coming and now is when the dead, that is the spiritually dead, those who are dead in trespasses and in sins, man by nature, he says, they shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Now, you might say that, well, Randy, you're up here speaking and you just read the words of the Lord Jesus and therefore you're speaking with the voice of the Son of God. No, I'm not. No, he doesn't say you, they'll hear the words of the Savior. They'll hear the voice. And I can prove that because Jesus tells us over here in verse 29, just uh, verse 28, just three verses down, he says, marvel not at this. For the hour is coming, that is in the future, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Whose voice? The Son of God, Jesus. And shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Now, on that last trumpet day, on the, on the last trumpet sounds, when Jesus Christ comes back, which every one of us look forward to, is Jesus going to use a preacher like me or someone else to go to the graveyard and say, Come forth. No, absolutely. That's, that's ridiculous. That's foolish to think. No, it's by his voice. Well, it's the same voice in both situations. Just like it's the same voice that he's talking about in the regeneration, in the, you know, in the, in the resurrection, in the regeneration. It's the same voice that brings forth life. Now, there's several examples in the Old Testament of people who were dead physically and they were brought to life. They, they were inanimate, and they became animate. Uh, and I think that this is significant. It's important for all of us to remember that everything that's in the Scripture is given to us uh, by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for us. It's to consider. But when we look at the Old Testament, what we're doing is we're trying to understand things about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in that same chapter I was reading to you, if you skip down to verse 39 of, of John chapter 5, you'll see where he says, search the Scriptures. Look at the law and the prophets. In them you think ye have eternal life. They thought that by keeping the law, they would make themselves just or right before God. The law cannot justify you, and the law cannot sanctify you. The law cannot give you eternal life, right? We all know that. But he says, they are they which testify of me. Okay, they testify of me. And so when we look at these, if you'll go with me briefly to a few places, there are, um, there are three instances in the Old Testament where people who had died were brought back to life. There were three physical resurrections in the Old Testament. There were four if you include Adam. And I want to start with that in, in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 2. You don't need to turn there, but I want you to think about that. How is, it, how is it that God created the first man? That's instructive. Okay? He formed his body out of the dust of the earth, and then he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. God did that immediately. He did it directly. He did it personally. 
and he gave Adam life. Now you might say, well, that's not really a resurrection, but I said, but there was a dead body there. Oh, by the way, let me, let me tell you all a joke. You're, this is, you know, you're not smiling enough. Have you noticed that all the planets in our solar system are named after, uh, uh, after Roman gods? Okay, have you noticed that? Like Mercury, uh, who's Hermes to the Greeks. Mars was the god of war. Zeus was the, the main god. Uh, Saturn was, was the former Titan. Okay, so on. Venus was Aphrodite. All of the planets are named after Roman gods except for Earth. Earth's just named after that stuff that's out there on the ground. Earth is named after the stuff that's out there on the ground. Okay. But I have a, there's a point to that. That stuff that's out there on the ground, that's what God made you from. That's some sacred ground. Because God created it. Now, it's under the curse that it, it has to uh, lie under until the resurrection. But this is a pretty special place. And God created all of us out of the dust of the earth. The things that are of this world. And when God created Adam, he formed him from the dust of the earth. He made him. He made him a body. But he wasn't alive until God breathed into him directly. Okay, And that's significant. That teaches us something. Because if you're going to have spiritual life, it's because Jesus Christ is going to come to you by the Holy Spirit and He's going to breathe life into you. Just like in the day that, is, that we all look forward to, that last day, Jesus is going to say, come forth. It's time, children. Come home. We're going. <laughs> We're going. Let's go. And it's going to be a glorious day. He's going to do it. That's how powerful God is. And that's what the Bible teaches us about regeneration. Okay, let's look at, um, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 17. There was a prophet by the name of Elijah, and he's a very important prophet in the Bible. In fact, he appeared with the Lord on uh, the Mount of Transfiguration along with Moses. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, we read about a widow woman of Sarepta. She's actually a, a Gentile woman, but God has sent the prophet in the days of famine to be sustained in this woman's house. And that's, you know the whole story about how that there's a cruise of oil and a barrel of meal and each day there's just enough food for them to, to eat. And God was teaching them, preserving them through all those years of famine, that he would be our, our daily provision of, of our bread and all that we need. But the, the, the woman's son, uh, and I'm assuming that he's probably a, a, a teenager or so, he's, he's a little bit older, uh, he's her sole support, and she die, or he dies, the son dies. And the woman, of course, is distraught, and she feels like it's a judgment of God for all of her sins. That's how... Someone who's born again, by the way, feels, you feel like uh, you're under condemnation of God. I've got some really good news for you. That's evidence that God has, has taught you that. You need to look to Jesus and you'll be relieved. Uh, but anyway, it says that he went into her uh, in verse 19. It says, he that is the prophet Elijah said unto her, the mom, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him down on his bed. So this dead boy is laying on the bed. And he, the prophet, cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself out upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And it says, the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Now notice Elijah didn't pronounce and say it himself. He didn't do it himself. You might say, well, Elijah was, was a, an intermediary. No, Elijah was a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ Okay, in this example. Because he lays down upon him, takes his form, takes his shape, is right there. He may have even put his arms out in the form of a cross. I don't know. But it was that direct contact that God moved. And God is teaching us by this how he gives life to his people. And I can establish that further by talking about some further things that are taught us in 2 Kings. Remember, Elijah uh, was translated to heaven. Uh, his uh, protege, his, the one who he was mentoring by the name of Elisha, asked for and received a double portion of all of the power and, 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 and authority and so on that Elijah had. God was pleased to do that. In Elisha's time, he did double the, the, uh, um, the, uh, the miracles that Elijah had done. Eli in the days of Elijah, there was one person raised from the dead. In the days of Elisha, there were two. 
The first one is, is, is told us about in 2 Kings chapter 4, and I will hurry for the sake of time. But I do want to point out to you that there's a widow woman that, that Elisha is uh, acquainted with. She's uh, very dear to them. She has a place where uh, he stays when he passes through their country. And word comes to Elisha that their son has died. Uh, this, this child that, that she had born was, was dead. And Elijah does a very strange, Elisha does a very strange thing. In verse 29, it says, Then said he to Gehazi, who is his servant, Gird up thy loins, and take, thy staff, take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. This is very strange. Very interesting thing. But the prophet says, take my staff and go to the child. Run, hurry. I'll, I'll be behind you, but you go on ahead and you lay that staff on the child. And so it says that he did that. The servant ran all the way to the place. He laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing wherein he went again to meet him and told him, saying, the child is not awake. It didn't work. Why in the world would there be something in the Bible where you had an instrument, and it didn't work. Because as we continue reading, you'll see that the, that the prophet comes, and he repeats the thing that Elijah had done. He lays himself upon the child. He's there face-to-face -face directly, and the child is arrived. Now again, if you look at this correctly, as I believe we're to do, through the lens of Jesus Christ, once again, we're being shown that it is Jesus Christ, the Lord, in symbolic form here, that gives life. And that does it immediately, and he does it instantaneously. And oh, by the way, he still does it even after he's dead. Because if you flip forward, we don't have time for that. But if you look at 2 Kings chapter 13, after Elisha is dead, they're working, they're disturbing his graves, and, and his bones come into contact. Uh, a, a, a dead man comes into contact with the bones of Elisha, and that man is brought back to life. What does that signify? Well, Jesus Christ is, is dead and alive forevermore. He still has the same power now that, that he ever did. And so these are just some examples that we have in the Scripture concerning immediate regeneration. You're not going to find one that is, that's instrumental. In the New Testament, we read in several places about three people that the Lord Jesus raised from the dead. And we find that in one case, he spoke to the young damsel. Uh, he said, young damsel, I say unto thee, arise, and by his power... By, by, his, by his authority, she came back to life. We find uh, another time when he was walking through a particular town, the city of Nain, that there was a, a poor widow woman whose, child, whose son had died, and they were carrying him to his, burial, uh, to his burial, and he didn't even have to touch the body. All he had to do was, was steady the bier that they were carrying him on, and the young man rose. And of course, the third example that we have is, is uh, Lazarus, who had been dead four days. This is important for this reason that it is the power of God that brings life. Okay? Now, what we worry about or what we try to say is, is that, well, if it's God that gives life uh, immediately, he gives it independently of what we do, then why preach the gospel? Why go to church? What benefit is there? Well, there's great benefit to that, of course. To be converted, that is to walk in the spirit and the kingdom of God is everything. And to those of you who have walked parts of your life outside the kingdom, I, I think you would agree with me. What the, what the preaching of the gospel does is it releases us. It manifests life. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a result. If someone has faith in Christ, and you ought to, you ought to confess him today. I, 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 I call you. The gospel is a call. You ought to believe. But only those that have been regenerated are going to... Uh, going to, to respond. You know, there's an important principle. There's one more point I'm going to make and I'll be done, and that is instrumentality. you got to think about if you have an instrument, if you have something that does something, it is adapted to the thing that it works upon. Right? I've used this example to you before. We talk about a vase. We don't have one right now because our communion is set up here, but normally we have a vase, and if we put fresh flowers in there, the vase is adapted to hold those flowers and allow water to be drawn up and keep the flowers fresh, and so that's what a vase is for, and that's what a vase acts upon, okay? You think about a hammer. A hammer is, is adapted to drive a nail into a piece of wood, okay? You'd be very foolish to... Uh, 
to say, I'm gonna, I need, I need to, something to drive this nail into this wood. Uh, let's, let's use the vase. Okay, well, that's a bad idea. It's obviously going to crack. It's going to be destroyed. You're going to make a big mess. You're going to cut your hand. If you tried to use a vase to drive a nail, just like if, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, someone brings you some beautiful cut flowers, you don't go to the, to the uh, um, laundry room and pull out a hammer. So what, what's this for? I don't need this. I need a vase, right? Well, notice this. There are many scriptures in the Bible that say that the gospel as preached by man is not adapted to bring enlightenment to the natural mind. Okay? It's not. Now, that'd be very interesting to me that if God intended for the gospel as preached by man to bring regeneration, then it would work. But he says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. He's not subject to them, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Okay? The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We find that in Romans chapter 8. We find that in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 2. Jesus was talking to certain Jews who did not believe him in, in John chapter 8. and says, why is it that you cannot understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Right? That's right. You cannot hear my word. Well, they were having a conversation. Jesus wasn't talking about the conversation they were having. They were saying there was no spiritual understanding. Okay, So when we think about uh, the Lord Jesus, and the last place I'm going to go is in Hebrews chapter uh, 9, because I'm going to pull this short. But I hope that you can see that these are just some of the illustrations that we have in the Bible. There is no teaching in the Bible of uh, an extraordinary means to being born again. Now, being converted, sure. But actually having life, there is none. And you'd think that there'd be at least one if that were the case. But every example that we have is that God immediately speaks life and he gives life just like he did in the very beginning and just like he's going to do at the end. But in Hebrews chapter 9, I just want to read these words. There is a means in the Bible. There is a means to your salvation. In verse 11, it says, But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and calves, or goats, goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Past tense. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who offered the eternal who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God that's the benefit that we have we who are made alive are now to act and to walk and be refreshed in the knowledge of what it is that Jesus Christ has done for us one more verse and for this cause he that is the Lord Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new testament he's the one and notice by what means by means of his death. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost, you were justified then. You were clean then. You were made right with God then. You, it was actually promised before the world ever began, but 2,000 years ago. But sometime during your life, God is going to fulfill the terms of his contract, the terms of this cup, and he's going to come to you, and he's going to speak life to you. And they that hear shall live. And then he's going to send his servants out into the world to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who I'm here to tell you about. And I want you to believe in him. I want you to place your faith in him. I want you to trust him. I want you to obey him. And that's what we're going to do now as we go through this communion. We're going to partake of the, uh, the communion supper, which commemorates the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why his death is so important, because it's the only means of your eternal salvation. Thank God that it was shed on our behalf. I thank you for your kind attention. We're now going to take